Timberlessly, Ben Hammersley na Campus Party you do Brasil! Woo! Yeah. Hi, my friend. Thank you for coming. Glad to be here. Okay. Tim, your second time in Campus Party, Brazil. Great to be back. Great to be back. And Ben Hammersley, first time in Brazil. Okay. Él les va a hablar, lembren, sobre cómo ellos se conocieron, van a responder a sus cuestiones y van a hablar del futuro de la red. Y más una sorpresa que nos tenemos para, para ellos. I have a sur uh, two surprises for us. Two. One now and other in the middle of the show. Okay. ¿Están listos? Sí. Un, dos, tres. Oh! Welcome, Campus Party. Ben Hammersley. Start. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paco. Good afternoon, Sao Paulo. It's going to be like this for the next hour and a half. We have perhaps two of the most important people in the world with us today. People who, if they hadn't been around, if they hadn't done their work, would, it would mean that you wouldn't be here yourselves. We're going to start with two small speeches, and then we're going to have questions for the next hour and a half. I'm taking questions on Twitter. It's going to be a fun afternoon. I'm very sorry this is in English, but everything will be okay. To start off the day, it's a great honor and a privilege to introduce our opening speaker, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Any way you like. Wow. <laughs> it's great to be here. It's great to be back. I was here two years ago. And it's got even bigger, even more exciting. Great to be at Campus Party. So I've just got a few minutes to say two things, really, uh, about the web. So the web, as it's been 20 years ago I invented the web. The internet's been around for 40 years, the web for 20 years, but in that time, it's just got more and more exciting. There are lots of things which are happening now out there on the web because people like you, complete just individuals, sometimes just working by yourselves or working with a pile of people or working with people out there on the net because people like you have been inventing more stuff. And the really, the most important thing for me about the web is that the web is a platform, it's a base for inventing more stuff. And it's just great to see so much of that happening here. There are people also creating, designing new protocols. We have HTTP, we have HTML, we have URLs. We have people inventing new protocols all the time. The World Wide Web Consortium has mailing lists where you can come and join and just be part of the web becoming a, a more exciting, more powerful place. For example, a lot of people now are working on HTML5. You've probably heard of HTML5. It's not just a new language for making web pages, not just a new markup language, but it's a whole computing platform. So you can, it's a whole place to do your programming. So What's coming to HTML applications are, is enough power to be able to make on the, in your web application anything that you can make in a desktop application. So HTML5 is one of the things which is really exciting. Um, other things that's really exciting is data. Data sounds boring for a lot of people because it's not like video, but for a programmer, you know that data is really interesting. And if you think about lots of the sites out there which are really interesting for you, like a music site or a weather site. All the websites out there about particular topics have got data behind them. And what's happening now is a revolution in data. There are standards for putting data out there on the web. People are taking data and combining it. And a really important thing, which I've been pushing for the last couple of years is open data, particularly open data from governments. So I'm glad to hear that there's some 
a little bit of open government data in Brazil. In the UK and in the USA, there have been some big projects to put a lot of data which is sitting there inside the government to put it out there. And if you're involved with the government here, I strongly recommend that you work to get the data about Brazil, about everything, economy, about the climate, for example, put it out there. Because it's interesting to people to connect it to other data. And that is becoming a very, very exciting way. So this open, linked open data, the standards are linked data. You can Google linked data, find out how to do them. Open data is really exciting. Part of that data is government data. That data is government data. And that's not, uh, another one of the waves. There are lots of other, of course, really exciting things that are happening. The way the web is getting onto huge screens, the way the web is getting onto really small screens, the way the web is gonna getting onto portable devices, and because it's getting onto portable devices, it's getting into places where people couldn't afford computers. So here, it seems most of you can afford a laptop. There are lots of countries where and lots of places out in rural areas where people can't afford a laptop, but you can make a web application which will work for them make, if you make it so that it will work on a portable device. So the mobile web is a really important and exciting revolution that's happened. So all these exciting things are happening on the web, and they're happening because you're all individually each programming new things and making new inventions. Is all this going to go on being fun forever and ever, for year after year, camp just getting bigger and bigger and bigger? Well, maybe, but maybe things will stop it. Maybe things will get in the way. So there are some things we have to be careful about. You're all connected through these cables, through this IPv6. Well done, getting it cabled up with IPv6. That's great. You're connected to everybody else, and you can send packets to anybody you want. Your program that you run here can connect to whoever it wants. And if you start a web server here, anybody in the world, more or less, can connect to your web server. That is why it's so exciting. That is what, that fact that anybody can connect to anything is part of net neutrality. The fact that the network, just the network, the network is not controlling what you do. You don't have to ask permission from someone central before that you, you connect to somebody else. It's really important now that everybody, each one of you that finds it exciting to use the internet, you also make sure that you help safeguard it. Keep it open. Keep it open because it's so powerful to take control of it that there are companies Big companies, big governments in countries who would really like to be able to control, to, they like to control which website. There are people who would like to charge you to set up a website so that you can't just let anybody go and see your website. So, large companies, some large countries, some large companies, are always tempted to try to control the internet too much and we have to make sure that it stays open. So that is something I give you a lot of excitement then but also I give you a responsibility to make sure that you do your pieces to keep it open. Thank you. you, you. Thank you Tim. Thank you for that. And now for our second speaker I'm sure you know who this man is. Ladies and gentlemen, Al Gore. Obrigado. Obrigado. I am very, very happy to be back in Brazil. Forgive me for speaking in English, but thank you for allowing me the courtesy. I can't speak Portuguese. I want to uh, say, first of all, what an honor it is for me to be on the same stage with Tim Berners-Lee. What Tim did 20 years ago when he invented the World Wide Web was a pivotal moment in the democratization of the Internet, making it possible 
for everyone to connect to it. I want to thank Ben Hammersley for moderating and my friends uh, Paco Rigeles uh, and Juan Negrillo uh, and everyone in the campus party. It's been uh, a pleasure for me to see some old friends here in Brazil like Marina Silva and uh, several others who are here. And before I say uh, a few words, we're going to have a, a conversation after these opening comments. But before I make my um, opening comments about the internet and the World Wide Web, I would like to uh, say from my heart a word uh, of, of sympathy uh, to all of the victims in Brazil of the mudslides and the flooding. I know that this nation has been undergoing a, a great trauma and the world is with you. We understand uh, how much uh, pain this has caused to so many families. I, I would also like to say briefly that we are at a turning point in the history of world civilization. We are here to talk about one of those turning points. The early days of the internet are still with us. The potential for the internet and the World Wide Web is vast. But we are also in crucial days where global warming is concerned. The climate crisis has been predicted for a long time to make large downpours like the ones in southeastern Brazil much more common. We have seen in the last 10 months epic flooding in Pakistan, epic flooding in Australia, epic flooding in Colombia, in, uh, on the other side of South America, in my home city of Nashville in the United States, and in many other locations. Every day we are putting 90 million tons of global warming pollution into the atmosphere. 20% of it that we put up today will still be there 20,000 years from now. Your generation, using the digital tools available on the internet and on the World Wide Web, has a mission to make this turning point in the history of our civilization a positive one. We have seen the quadrupling of human population in less than 100 years. We will add another 2 billion people in the next 40 years before the population stabilizes. We are using resources with abandon. We are polluting the ecosphere of the earth, most importantly by creating this climate crisis. But you have seen for yourselves the way the internet can empower individual men and women who care about something better, a better world, a better future. But it is up to you to join together in creating that better future. Hundreds of years ago, the birth, the rebirth of the ancient Greek dream of democracy came in the wake of an exciting new technology for communications, the printing press. The Enlightenment followed. Free markets and free governments came in the wake of this new ability people had to connect to a world of ideas and to select those ideas and those bodies of knowledge that were most interesting to them and seemed to be most closely approximating the truth. In more recent 
decades, over the last 60, 70 years. The communications technologies of first radio and then television have served in some ways to dumb down democracy, to turn citizens into consumers, to turn the populace into the audience with one-way flows of communication, with people sitting back and simply consuming what was put on their television screens. But starting 20 years ago, and starting before that with the antecedents, but truly starting with the World Wide Web, this new ability for individuals to connect to one another digitally and to explore a universe of knowledge at their own pace according to their own curiosity and to connect to others who had common interests has reawakened the possibility that we can bring democracy to vivid life, that we can have free markets that are truly free, that we can pass on education and values to the next generation in a much more powerful way. But the way you use these tools is critically important. Follow your hearts toward something better. Don't give up. Keep the dream of free people alive. Don't let, and I hear I echo in my closing words before we go into the interchange, the same sentiment that Tim Berners-Lee expressed. Defend the internet. Do not let it be controlled by governments or by large corporations. It is a network of people. Obrigado. Well, thank you very much. I think we should really open the conversation running on from that. And I'd like to turn to Tim. We're talking about defending the internet. How can the Camposeros do that? What, what, are, the, what are the first steps that we can have to defend the internet? Uh, you, to be aware of when your traffic is being uh, or somebody you know f finds that they can't get to a website, you have to be aware of what's going on. So you guys are smart enough to make tools to test it. Test what, what the connectivity is to different things. So here, when you hear of uh, that a new internet service company has come to town and they have rules that you can, uh, that for example, you can't use your favorite telephone software, or you can't use Skype or something, or you can't go to certain websites, um, then protest. No. Here you go. Sure. Protest. Talk to, every peop talk to your friends. Okay. To, uh, complain to the company. You can, switch com you can switch companies to another company but also complain to the government. And if you see the government doing it, okay, then you need also to get your friends together. And if necessary, you need to go out in the streets. Okay, so everybody thinks that you think it's this important. Okay, so you just make sure that wherever you go, the internet is open. Every now and again, you'll see something happen when somebody tries to close it off. And right then, you protest, you take action, you complain you make, you, until it's changed. So what you're, what you're saying is that people should actually take to the streets in defense of the internet? At the, not at first. First you write letters and first you tweet and you write blog and you blog about it. Okay, so first you do it on the network. But at the end of the day, if nobody listens to what you're saying on the net, then at the end you peacefully demonstrate outside your, the corporation or the government in question. Peaceful revolution in the streets? Well, I, I think that one of the greatest uh, unmet 
potentials of the Internet is to be used by citizens to make government work the way it is supposed to work. All of you know when you are doing business with a company that understands customer service, e efficiency, and the ability to use the digital tools to become a high-performing organization. You can name the companies that behave that way, and you like to do business with them. Government should be the same way. It should be possible for every government department, and here my words are not aimed at the government of Brazil at, at all. I have a great deal of respect and admiration for the government of Brazil, the tremendous progress that is being made. But all around the world, the same thing is true, including in the United States of America. Government is not efficient and high performing because it has not yet adapted to the new possibilities of the internet and the World Wide Web. Citizens can drive that revolution. And it is important to do so because when you do, then you acquire the ability to defend the World Wide Web and to fight against laws and proposals that restrict freedom and hurt the operations of uh, efficient markets. That was a really interesting point about governments not being at the same speed as the internet. Now, Tim, you work with the British government with, with open data and, and that sort of thing. Can you, talk, can you tell us what you're doing there and, and what it means? So I, um, it started really in the beginning of 2009, I thought, 2009 is going to be the year that I tell people to put data on the web because they had documents on the web, but data was not really on the web. And then uh, I gave a talk at TED, when I could, which was a chance to talk about that. And then later I was talking to the then British Prime Minister, Gordon Brown. Uh, we were having a, 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 a lunch and he turned to me and he said, so what should... The, the United Kingdom do to make the best use of the internet. I said, you should put all your government data on the web. And he said, okay then, we'll do it. Now that was pretty good to get from the Prime Minister this thumbs up. And we got the thumbs up from ministers all the way down. And meanwhile, people working for the government doing data were all excited about doing this already. So it, it was in the top, it was in the middle and at the bottom. And so we had just for a few months a very quick project to change the way of thinking. Change the way of thinking so that if you're in, in the government and you've got some data and every, maybe every three months you make a report and you make some data and you store it on a disk. Just every three months you make the report and you store the data on a website. It's just as easy to store it on a website just to store it on a disk. Uh, you can store it in both places. But the mentality is that by default, the data which has been produced by the government using taxpayers' money was to be open. And at the same time in the United States of America, then Barack Obama had also had a memo came out saying that the same idea was really important in America. Openness to putting data. So we had this project so you can go to data.gov.uk and see the UK one, data.gov for the US one, and there are lots of now other projects in different countries around the world, and also cities and regions of the world also, which are very, very important, also have these projects to put their data out there. It's been really uh, exciting few months. So we had a question on Twitter earlier today from Nelly Cruz, who's a European commissioner, who asked... Uh, a question specifically for you, which was how can we use this open data that's being published by governments to start to fight climate change? Well, that's a, it's a great question. And for, first of all, where, where the internet is concerned, the Im, Im, embedded systems placed in machines and things 
make it possible to use the internet to drive much higher levels of efficiency and reduce uh, global warming pollution uh, and make business uh, more profitable and efficient. But the internet that we most care about, the World Wide Web, connects people, not things. And as human beings, we have, uh, we are driven to connect dots and to see patterns. And part of the value of Tim Berners-Lee, uh, Lee's latest uh, reform proposal to make large, deep data troves open and available is that it makes it possible for people to go into that data and connect the dots in ways that they've never been connected before. Let me give you a, a specific example, and this may be an impossible mission, but I will lay it out here anyway, just thinking out loud. To all of the Camposeros in Brazil, in all of the countries where the campus party has signed people up for this uh, peaceful, nonviolent, global digital revolution. Imagine for a moment if this data was used to identify in every country the 10 largest sources of global warming pollution. And then there was a, a, digi a webcam aimed at the smokestack or the other manifestations of the pollution 24 hours a day live on the internet. And then going into the data, imagine that the Camposeros constructed a map showing all of the people, some of us included, most of us probably, that are connected by electricity lines or a product roadmap to the facility that is one of the top 10 largest polluters of global warming pollution in every country. And then imagine that the Camposeros started a competition to see which of these 10 could come off the list. And all of the customers and those connected to it were encouraged to take part in reducing the emissions that had made that facility one of the worst in that country. I think that the rising awareness of how all of us are connected to the patterns that are destroying the climate could be one of the most powerful ways to bring about change. But that's only one proposal. There, come up with your own. Many already have, but the tools available on the World Wide Web and the Internet make it possible for people to play an active role in bringing about the changes in policy and the changes in consumption patterns that are causing the climate crisis. We, we've been talking about open data and openness and, and the power of the individual and so on, but, but there are, and all of the examples we've had so far have been very... Uh, very positive, but there have been other there, there have been other examples over the past few months, very famous examples where openness some people seem to think that openness may have gone a little bit too far, for example, the WikiLeaks um, affair where, where do you stand on on that well i, I 'm old enough to remember the the Pentagon papers, which uh, was on a smaller scale, uh, very similar, but it involved uh, printed uh, words on, on paper. This is not a problem of the internet, except that, except insofar as the internet increases the power to do anything, to distribute material that's obtained improperly, if, if I, I am not familiar with the, the statutes involved and whether or not that's a crime, I've heard people say that it is a crime. And this, that, that, that is uh, an issue in and of itself. But it is not uh, unique to the Internet. Now, the, the, 
the quick spread of the data can, uh, of course, be accelerated unimaginably by use uh, of, the, of the internet. But the struggle between uh, governments that want to hold information and journalists and others who want to reveal the information is one that should be carried out according to law. Uh, and I, I think that the, the rule of law I is important. So as a former journalist, I know that sometimes the leaking of information uh, is justified because the importance of what's being kept secret uh, doesn't justify uh, the level of classification assigned to it. And there may be some of that in these documents as well. But Tim, it, again with the sort of open data, is there a limit to the amount of stuff that should be released? Are you, are you for everything or are you for certain? Uh, we've never, when we talk about open government data, we talk about data, about specific sorts of data which, for example, they are not about personally identifiable people, for example. So there are some data, so people's health records, for example, with their individual identity in it, obviously you don't put out as open government data. There are lots of things. Military secrets are going to continue so long as we have armies and navies and air forces, there will be military secrets. And so, uh, and governments, any organization needs to have some internal, a few internal papers that it can have to, in order to operate, uh, in order to protect the people in it. But, so there are some things which just have never been included. So, the things, for example, which, were, uh, which went on WikiLeaks, which were actually stolen, which, which, which were taken against the rules, somebody broke the rules, then they broke the rules. That's not what we're talking about with open government data. With open government data, we're talking about things like, where are all the holes in the road? What is the climate? How deep was the flood? Whose houses were, where were people's houses in general flooded? Where are the floodplains? Where should I build my house if I don't want to get flooded again? We're talking about information that the government has. The government has prepared that really important information using a lot of time, a lot of effort, and also often a lot of skill. There's, these are experts that have produced this information. Now we're saying that the value of it is of that information is locked up and can't be used. So this is data which when it's released, it's not going to harm anybody. It's not going to blow any corporate military sec or military secrets. It's data, but it's data which is going to be not just useful for keeping track of governments, but it's going to make the whole world work better because if you're running a company, having data about the world is just useful for running the company. If you're running a website, having data about things, about songs and weather and, uh, and, and people and places, it's just valuable for making a website. And if it's freely available, then makes your website easier to make. The web, all the websites get better. Making a website gets easier. The whole country and the whole world just works better. Tim, when you invented the, uh, the web 20 years ago, um, it was for, if I'm right, it was for information sharing amongst physicists. It was for data sharing then, really, as you're pushing with government data now. But all of these people, and ourselves included, I'm sure, use the web for many, 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 many other things. Do you ever... Um, do you ever feel uneasy about some of the directions that the web is going in? Or, or do you just accept the bad with the good, as it were? I think, well, it wasn't, the, the web wasn't designed just for physicists. No, sure. Of course, but uh, people who started it were having the salaries paid to do physics, and so that we had to kind of make sure that physicists used it. But it was called the World Wide Web, and so it was the, the whole point about the web is you can use it for anything. The web should be like a blank sheet of paper. You should be able to do anything with it. So it's really important that the web itself doesn't try to only work for beautiful poetry. Because what's beautiful poetry is very subjective. It, work, it should work for terrible poetry and beautiful poetry. Terrible art. Ter and then the reader on the web can choose. So in general, 
the diversity of things on the web is really important. That said, if you worry, you said, what am I, am I worried about things happening? The web works because it is decentralized. There's no one controlling place. When you find that a lot of the web, in fact, is based on just one website, if it's, whether it's just one uh, status website, whether it's just one social website, or just one search engine, whenever there's a monopoly in any field, it's bad when for, it's bad for business. Whenever there's a monopoly on the internet, which makes it centralized, then it's very bad. It's very bad for the web, it's very bad for people using it, and it's very bad particularly for the mass of innovation by people like you. So I'm, the only thing that worries me really uh, uh, is when I worry about one website just becoming completely dominant, and then the only ideas which would come out onto the web would be come from the labs of the company which runs the one big website. The one big website problem is one problem. Do you, do you, do you see any other worries with the internet as it is right now, or is it all hopeful? Well, well, I think that in addition to the concerns Tim raises uh, about uh, one or a few uh, uh, services or websites or, or networks gaining such a dominant position that it hurts competition and creativity. In addition, there is the problem, and Tim mentioned this as well, the problem of governments trying to control the internet. And w we have seen this in, in many countries. Uh, and that, that is something that must be uh, resisted uh, at all. It, it really is extremely important for the future uh, of human civilization, I think, uh, b because the internet gives us the potential to really shift uh, into a much higher gear in, in the effort to build self-government, representative democracies, free markets that work for small and medium-sized businesses and not just for large corporations. The, the, the free flow of communication unimpeded either by government or by monopolies or oligopolies is, is crucially important. What can, we talked earlier about uh, what the Camposeros can do about censorship and so on. Tim was talking about having testing software and, and so on. As somebody who's been in government, why do you think that governments are so keen on restricting the internet? It seems even in, even in uh, countries which are based on free speech, there seems to be a tide towards restriction. Is it, is it, is it just an inherent thing that governments fight against, or is it something deeper than that? Well, the old saying is information is power. Uh, and free governments do not usually fear power in the hands of people in a free country. And that is why you see the most egregious examples of governments trying to control and censor the internet uh, in a total in author authoritarian countries, I have thought for quite some time that it would be impossible for them to succeed in this task. I still believe that, but I have been concerned that that some nations have gone a long way toward really uh, clamping down on the flow of information available over the internet. Uh, and, and so I, I, am, I am concerned about it. But we just saw over the weekend, for example, with Tunisia, that you can only push people so far. And so that maybe there is hope that the sort of young people and so on can, can use the internet and, and it will create a, a situation for revolution. <clears throat> well, I think that in, um, in, in, in Tunisia, the wireless internet uh, to smartphones and cell phones uh, 
enabled the rapid spread of information far beyond what the government there could, could have any hope of, of controlling. That's exactly true. Uh, but this has been true in, in times past. Uh, Martin Luther launched the Reformation with the, with the printing press. Mm -hmm. When uh, um, Khomeini launched the Iranian Revolution in 1979, uh, it was with cassette tapes, cassette audio tapes. The rest of the information flow was controlled, but he was able to spread those all over. Now with, uh, with, with Twitter and Facebook and uh, all of the various tools that are available, it's virtually impossible for it to be stopped. Now there are the examples that I referred to earlier where all of the routes into a country are monitored and clamped down and uh, Tunisia was not uh, a country like that. There are countries that have become very sophisticated and expend vast sums of money to, in an effort to try to clamp down all of the information. It's, it's not just the countries when you look, uh, that you might think of the, where the, the freedom of the internet is at stake. So uh, in, in America, for example, there is a bill currently which people have been trying to put through the Senate, the COICA bill, which, is to, uh, which allows the government to set out, without a court being involved, a list of blacklisted uh, internet domain names, which then any American internet service provider would be, it would be illegal for them to, de uh, to look to, to uh, allow people to access them. Um, what, the way this can happen, for example, is that uh, the when it, uh, it has changed, because initially, when the internet was first put together and the web first spread over it 20 years later, it was very difficult to just get the packets from one place to another because you needed very fast processing power and you, had to, and you needed the fastest sort of cables you could get. Now, processors are very powerful. So in your internet service provider, you can put in a box like the one in the middle of the room, you can put a few more racks of things called, which do deep packet inspection. Deep packet inspection is technology which allows a company to watch everything you're doing. Instead of just passing the packets on, it looks at them, looks at each packet, figures out what's going on, tracks which, which per house it came from, which apartment it came from, tracks what the people in that apartment are reading on the web, and it allows you to then build a profile of what sort of things those people are interested in. Are they interested in particular sorts of clothing? Are they interested in particular sorts of sex? Are they interested in particular diseases? Maybe they have a particular disease. Maybe they have cancer. If you have that information as a commercial company, then you're very tempted to sell it to the insurance company who wants to know if they might have cancer, to somebody who may want to sell them to, so that you give them advertising, might want to send them paper advertising to their door, advertising sexual things because they thought maybe these people were interested in particular sorts of sex because they thought that they went to that sort of website. So if you then, if it then becomes a commercial proposition for a company to keep a really, really accurate profile of who you are and what you do, and that profile is sitting there on a disk, and then a slightly paranoid government decides to use uh, or a law that was put in case in place in order to prevent terrorism, then suddenly what became something which was accumulated for commercial benefit is then available to the government. And the government has got available all the people's interests, including which party they probably are going to vote for in the next election. So then you have a, a, a process which is very, which is very serious and it's very and you have systems where which are very very powerful very unbelievably powerful at identifying not just who's in that apartment but exactly who you are we've had a lot of uh, privacy workshops recently and it's been very interesting how very easy it is to pinpoint exactly who it is that's looking at that website even when they have private browsing turned on so that 
so that that's the way things could go in a, in a civilized country, then that uh, it could also yeah, go yeah. down to, to a position I mean, where the government has a lot of, suddenly gets a lot of data about individuals. Uh -huh. Just one brief follow-up comment. <clears throat> the, the law that Tim referred to that was proposed in the U.S., I doubt very much that will pass, but it serves as an example of how citizens need to be active in opposing such ideas. But beyond that, we need new laws that affirmatively protect the privacy of those who use the internet. Laws that prohibit the, the kinds of deep packet inspection and violations of privacy that now already uh, go on in some cases. Uh, Dictionary.com, according to the Wall Street Journal, puts something like 43 cookies and beacons uh, into the computer of anybody who goes to that site just to look up a word. And most of it is benign, perhaps all, I don't know. But the marketing of that profile information uh, to advertisers who then use it to come back to someone who's just looked up a word on the internet, that should be prohibited in my opinion. The, the technology that enables you to do that sort of deep packet inspection and this sort of monitoring, which we, we might use for commercial purposes in one country, could also be used by restrictive regimes in uh, another. And is. And should there be, talking about laws that protect our own personal privacy, should there be almost export restrictions in the way that it's very difficult to sell weaponry to a prescribed state? Should we not be able to sell deep packet deep packet inspection routes to a prescribed state? Well, there are such laws. Uh, there, there are laws on the export of raw processing power. But those laws have been difficult to enforce. And when you have uh, so many different sources of hardware and software, it's very difficult mm. to, to enforce such laws. But there have been examples of companies in the West who value their reputation and their, their, their brand uh, as supporting democracy and free markets, uh, who have been found to have supplied uh, software to restrictive regimes that then turn around and use it for police state functions. And they have been bitterly criticized mm. for that. And some of them have changed their behavior as a result. That is another example of how the users of the World Wide Web can help defend it. Because when a company that should know better participates in that activity, they ought to pay a price. In fact, one of the uh, exciting things about working with the World Wide Web Foundation, uh, which is looking at how people use the internet across the world, is that in developing countries, People can look at this issue and solve it. Look at what's happening in the developed, in quotes, companies, countries, and look at it freshly and before the internet spreads and becomes a very strong force, make sure that it's got a very strong footing. Follow countries like Finland, where the right to communication has now been established as a human right. So I think that's really exciting, looking across the world. Well, uh, well, we'll we're going to move on to the Web Foundation in a minute because that's a very big subject, and I really want to talk about it. But, but we do have a second surprise for the two of you, as the as Hello. the audience knows, and Paco is back on stage. I have a surprise for both guys. A third people. Vou falar português. Eu gostava que uma terceira pessoa tiver cá com eles. Ela não pôde vir cá, mas Ontem enviou para mim no meu e-mail um vídeo para que eles olharam. See the screen, please. The big screen. Tan tan. Ok. Val. Ok. 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 Hi, my name is Vince Cerf. I'm Google's chief internet evangelist, but uh, today you're going to have to put up with the virtual event because I'm not able to join you at the campus party in Brazil. 
I really regret that because I understand that my good friends uh, Al Gore and Tim Berners-Lee are going to be with you. Uh, and I can't imagine anything more fun than uh, being there together uh, in, to sing a trio to, uh, to the wonderful uh, experience that you're uh, about to have or maybe you've already started. Uh, when Paco told me about Campus Party, my first reaction was, uh, you know, what does this mean? Uh, alcohol and uh, screaming and yelling and uh, water balloons. But no, he said that it was all about people getting in touch with computing, uh, taking advantage of other people's information and knowledge, sharing this with each other, and accelerating uh, the uh, ability of everyone involved to make use of computers and to offer uh, software for others to share. Uh, this has to be uh, one of the most interesting um, phenomena, I think, of our 21st century, the fact that computing is so available now to so many people uh, at such young ages, at least by my definition. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite astonishing to see the uh, level of creativity that these uh, widely available platforms offer. Uh, the uh, app stores for Android or for the iPhone or other uh, mobiles or uh, other uh, open source operating systems uh, like uh, Chrome and Linux uh, have really unleashed a remarkable explosion of uh, creativity uh, and ideas. And of course, uh, those of us who uh, don't necessarily have time to uh, write software uh, all the time benefit from that. Uh, I once made my living writing software too, but that was way back in the uh, dinosaur period, uh, somewhere in the uh, deep Triassic. Uh, in any case, uh, I really do uh, envy you this opportunity, and I understand that there are plans afoot to try to bring a campus party to the United States. And uh, certainly, uh, if that should occur, uh, I'm very interested in participating, uh, as I suspect will be many of my colleagues at Google. So uh, I will uh, leave you uh, with uh, the good note uh, that you really have a wonderful opportunity to make new friends. Uh, to invent uh, new ideas and try things out. Uh, and I hope you'll share uh, the results with others so that they too will uh, understand more about what Campus Party means and what opportunities it creates. In the meantime, uh, it's Virtual Vint signing off. I'll see you on the net. Oh, un aplauso forte! Is the Campusero surprise for us. <laughs> for all <laughs> Thank you, Pekka. Thank you. Virtual. No more surprises. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no more. Uh, thank you, Pekka. Thank you, Virtual Vint. Vint served that. Um, as we were saying before, Vint turned up. <sighs> Quite. Um, the Web Foundation. This is your new... Very good, very good, very good. Okay. Should we start over there and go that way? Yeah? Three, two, one. Okay, so right back at you. we were talking about the Web Foundation. This is your new, your new thing. Explain what's going on. Well, I've been working with people very like you, uh, geeky people, people who uh, change the world by uh, figuring out how software could be different and better and writing that software. And uh, the result, of course, you know, have been lots of standards they've produced in web consortium. I've also, but also I've worked with students and we've tried to get people doing, uh, looking at the web, at, or about the way humanity works on the web, which is, you know, it's a really big complex thing from the scientific point of view. So I've looked at the engineering of it and the science of it. And when we were doing the science, we thought, you now what are we trying to do here? Well, you know, the goal is that the web should serve humanity. That you, we couldn't find any simpler way or more complicated way of saying really what we wanted to do. The web should serve humanity. 
But then we stepped back from that and we thought, wow, actually, hmm, when you talk, is what we're doing going to make sure that the web serves humanity? We're all the geeks. We are the, you know, the Camposeros-like people out there doing fun things. And we're developing things. Are we developing things for each other? Are we ignoring the fact that only 20% of the world use the web? The other 80% of the world don't use the web. Should we be rethinking what we do? Should we be spending some of our time not just making it really, really, really cool for the 20%, but should we make it, spend some of our time making it possible for the 80%? Other things we could do, which would mean that the 80% would get onto the web maybe five years earlier. So it's, so it's been crazy. I mean, it's only been a few months, but we've uh, been to uh, various countries, quite a few countries in Africa, which has been really exciting, just looking at pe how people use the web. And of course, we've talked to lots of organizations who are already really involved in, in figuring these things out. We've got involved in some projects helping people use the web to, uh, to make their lives better, some with people doing things which will allow the web to penetrate better, some projects trying to figure out what we need to do to get open data to happen in developing countries, which is, in fact turns out to be really important. There's a huge number of projects, so it's, it's, uh, it's really exciting, but it's just very much, uh, very much the start, but, one of, uh, but it's something where, when I talk to almost anybody who's involved in web development, they, you know, they get excited about, and they start thinking, ah, oh, you know, this thing that I'm de I've been developing for my, the kids that I know in the city, how would it work for somebody in a remote African village? Or so, how would it work for somebody uh, who is illiterate, who's in a, an, an American city, but who's illiterate, and so can't use the web at the moment because it's too text-oriented? So people, I found the people in general are, are getting very excited about this whole question about what we can do for the other 80%. So we have a room full of amazing developers. What can they do? How, how can they join in? Is it time yet, or, or should they wait a, f a year or two for, you to, for things to be started, or can they, can they contribute now? Oh, you can. A lot of the things that we've found that have been really exciting have been developed, you know, things which have been developed uh, like in Kenya, Ushahidi came out, an open source thing for helping people track what's going on, whether it's in riots or w uh, it w in uh, a crisis like the Haiti earthquake. Uh, there have been uh, one of the things which I thought was a great example of people worldwide uh, getting involved over the web, for example, was when the uh, is the open street map in general. There has been an exciting project to map uh, the slums in Nairobi, the map Kibera project, uh, which where lots of people, some people have gone to Nairobi to do the mapping and to help people in Nairobi learn how to use a GPS, learn how to make the map, and put the, the, their town literally on the map. Other people have done the mapping from sitting in their houses. And then those people who've done map helped create this open street map, open street map is like a big wiki. I think I may have talked about it two years ago, but it's like a big wiki map and you can help build it. Uh, when the earthquake struck in Haiti, there were very bad maps of Port-au-Prince where the earthquake struck. But after some satellite images were released with open license, all over the world, people like you just got on there, looked at the images and drew the maps. And you could see, there's a, you could see on YouTube, there's a time lapse uh, on Vimeo. There's a time lapse video of all the of the map just in real time, getting better and better and better. So th there are lots of things you can help with. Get to know people in different countries. Get to know people across the net, not just people like yourself. Get to know people in different countries. Connect to them. Learn what their environment is like. Teach them your technology you know. Connect to them. You will find that, not, you know, that they're really smart, very creative in every country. You'll find that they've got their own ideas. They may not 
understand how the, the open source community works, you can explain. They may not understand how the web works, you can explain. But you can make networks across all these different countries. Okay, you can go do it by yourself. You don't have to wait for us. We've touched on a lot of big problems. Tim has just touched on a, an awful lot of them. We've been talking about climate change and so on. One of the things we were talking about earlier, this, earlier in the day was, uh, was education. And, and you had some very interesting thoughts about education and about the way that children are educated now. Maybe if you could share them as undeveloped as they are with, with everybody here. Well, most of our modern educational process uh, is still based on the approaches and techniques that came out of the revolution of the printing press. And one of the challenges that some fam families face is that time in the classroom uh, compared to playing games on the computer or surfing the net and using all of these digital technologies seems uh, boring for some young people. And I, I think that our civilization is overdue for the invention of a new search-based uh, educational model that takes advantage of the natural curiosity children have to explore the world and teachers could be search guides uh, and children could learn according to th their own curiosity taking them from one subject to the next laterally, linearly, horizontally, vertically into the world of information uh, with uh, a guiding process that I don't think has been invented yet. And I, I have not yet seen a search-based educational model, though there may be some that are in existence. I don't know about them. But I just think that it's time for the educational system to be brought fully into the 21st century. Tim, this is another example of, of, a, of a major area of human endeavor where as soon as the web or the internet touches it, it transforms it completely. I've, I've lost track of the number of industries, major industries over the past 20 years that the internet has touched and, and, and destroyed in a creative way. Is, 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 there a, is there an end to this? I mean, what have you done? <laughs> I mean, the internet, is, is it, is, are we really in the middle of, of something where, when, where every industry is being radically transformed? I think uh, we are in the middle of it, or maybe we're, I think we're still at the beginning of it. It's very silly to look back and say, look how much it has transformed, without realizing that actually it's changing faster and faster. So the transformations are going to happen sooner and sooner. Various, the computing power is getting faster. Uh, the connectivity is getting faster. What is not getting faster is a person. Some people say they're getting better at multitasking because they practice when they're doing their homework and talking to friends and doing other homework and watching a movie and talking to some friends. But, and that may be true, that people are, people are multitasking more, but still a person is a person. And so what we have to do with the web is to make sure we use every person as well as we can. And part of that, absolutely I agree with Al, is that education, the, you know, use, education system which has not really changed. Another system which has not really changed is democracy. We elect in people in various different ways, but typically in most countries, there are elections locally, and then those people are then sent to go, as it were, on horseback. You would, you would go and vote somewhere which you could get to on horseback or walking, and then the person you elected would then go off on horseback or by train to the central government. And uh, you'd have to rely on them doing, working on your behalf because 
you didn't have time and you didn't have the ability to go there yourself. But now we, you do have the ability to go there yourself. I don't think this means that everybody should have a vote on everything because I know that most people don't know very much. I don't know much about what sort of things. I know that some people know a lot about some things. Some people know a lot about other things. How can we build systems? How can we build democratic systems that allow us to sort ourselves into groups, into ex groups of people who are expert in different ways? How can we connect those people together into groups of people who've got, I, you know, who've got good ideas, who got some people who are going to sort those ideas and test those ideas? The, the problems of designing the economy so that it works, you know, it's a mathematical problem which we haven't solved. It's very connected to web science. It's about the problem of understanding how all the people in the world can now best be connected on the web. It's not obvious. But when we solve that problem, as we solve that problem, maybe some of the websites that you produce will use new systems of governance. They'll use new ways, like new forms of Wikipedia, for example. You'll have to invent your own governance. And you'll end up designing, perhaps, a really interesting form of democracy. And maybe some of you will design systems of democracy which work really well across the internet. They really maximally make use of all the good stuff that we've got in all our heads by connecting us together in different ways. Maybe those new forms of democracy which come out of the internet will then be ones we'll end up using. They'll replace the ones we use for governing our countries and governing the world. So there's a huge amount to be done because it's working very badly at the moment. I, I, I want to make one comment that's important to me in, in response to that. Uh, I agree fully that the internet should empower new ways for citizens to participate in democracy. And I, I mentioned that earlier. I, I think it's absolutely crucial. B but I as a U.S. Uh, citizen, proud of the uh, revolution and constitutional uh, process that we developed two, two and a quarter centuries ago, I just want to add one caveat. The representative nature of representative democracy was chosen in the case of the United States n not only because of the practical impossibilities, uh, practical impossibility of all citizens deliberating on all questions, and you said you're not in favor of that. But it was also chosen because of a deep insight into human nature. We make decisions as human beings in a lot of different ways, impulsively, passionately, uh, deliberately, and there are different parts of the brain that are involved. A and some of the decisions democracies have to make require deep reflection. And representatives are supposed to be playing that role. Now my own view, and it's partly a US-centric view, is that the dominance of television in the democratic process now requires those who are candidates for office, at least in my country, to raise ever larger sums of money to purchase television advertisements. Eighty percent of the money in both of the major political parties in my country is spent on 30-second television advertisements. And that money comes mainly from business lobbies. And so their influence has been growing. Eventually, television will sink into the digital universe. Already, we are seeing the rise in the political significance of the, uh, of the Internet and the World Wide Web. But I wouldn't want to eliminate that crucial role uh, of uh, the, the, the representatives who are supposed to deliberate in their decision-making process. One other point briefly. Remember, everybody talks about Moore's Law and how the computers get twice as powerful roughly every two years, or the computer chips do. 
but there's also Metcalf's law, not as well known, but really crucial for the purpose of the campus party and for your ability to, to, to do what you want in your lives using these digital tools. And Metcalf's law says that the value of a, of a network increases as according to the square of the number of people connected to it. So as the number of people who connect to the World Wide Web and the internet at large increases, the value for political uses, for social uses, business uses, all uses, accelerates much more rapidly. And so this movement to bring more people into uh, personal contact with the internet, connected to it and connected to others through it, is a process that builds uh, a global awareness. Many have said it is as if these are the neurons of a global consciousness. I, I happen to believe that is the case, that we are moving toward an ever greater global consciousness which we need to combat problems like the climate crisis. So, do you see, um, I, was, I thought you were going to come in there. Um, but, one of the big uh, trends that we, people are talking about at the moment is uh, curation rather than search, and this sort of crowd curation model that's, that people are that people are bringing out again. How do you see the the web is now? How many trillion pages, maybe? How do how do we see how do you see um, people being able to handle that amount of choice, that amount of information, the, the information overload problem, the search problem and so on. This, this question, you, you talk about the curation question, curation, the, the job of looking after information and particularly of deciding which pieces of information are most valuable. That question, the, it's really the question of all that stuff, what should I read? Or if you like, of all that stuff, what should I believe? That's a question that humanity has had for <laughs> aeons. It's had, no, people have discussed it since the Greeks. That in fact, we talked about democracy. At the, democracy is our current best attempt to answer the question, what should we do? How do we decide collectively what to do? And this question of what should we collectively decide what to believe has, for the last few decades or centuries, been science. So since the Enlightenment, then science has been the answer. The answer is to decide what you, do, you know, what you believe. You do scientific experiments, and you you believe the ones that are repeatable, and you make models and hypotheses. And so this whole idea of science, which is really really important, underlying lots of uh, all the all the things which we believe personally, and all the things which we believe as a society, but it's behind that, there is a method which it's not only doing experiments, it's also how the scientific community review what are crazy ideas, or great and good ideas. And it's really important that when people have crazy ideas, and people are having crazy ideas all the time, that there are some well-established scientists who can sit down and take a deep breath and say, you know what, this idea is crazy, we shouldn't let him publish it. And it's also really important that when somebody has a crazy idea and they want to publish it, and the well-established scientists say, this guy is crazy, we shouldn't let him publish, and they're wrong, there's a mechanism, there's a way of the little guy, that, that idea, getting, finding a way around. There's a way of him challenging the established thought. So throughout history, there have been times when suddenly the established thought has been turned over. So when you do that, when you build a system, for example, for Wikipedia, that's a curation, because communal curation system. When you build the open street map, that's a, a, a curation system. They're all communal creation systems. I think that just like with democracy, it's very, very closely connected. Building new systems for creation, for, for curation, curation is of the data is uh, going to be a really interesting challenge and a really important one 
before we can cope with all this. In the few minutes that we have remaining, let's move it into slightly less epic problem territory into something, into things more down to earth and personal. We're talking about curation and information overload and where people get their information. Just personally, the traditional question of what's your favorite website is perhaps a bit overbroad, but how do you use the internet personally? Well, I use it all the time, and I begin, I, I started to say I begin each day by going through a whole series of, uh, of websites. I actually usually, at, at the end of the day, look at the morning newspapers around the world, uh, some of them, uh, because they're already up, depending on the time zone you're in. Uh, and I go to some aggregated uh, sites. I have a, a Google News uh, page that I've carefully selected with uh, different feeds. Um, uh, I use Current.com, which is uh, a network that that uh, I chair. Uh, and and I go to uh, lots and lots of uh, websites. I probably go to, I would say, about 30 or 40 each day. And I may not spend too much time on each one. And you begin to see patterns when the, the same news is treated slightly differently. And, and by the time I get through, I feel like I have a pretty good understanding of what's happened that day. But are you also, you have a Twitter stream, but that's probably... Yes, I, yeah, I, I have a Twitter stream and I follow Twitter and uh, Facebook and... Now, if I lived in Brazil, I would be on Orkut, uh, w which I know is very big here. Um, and and uh, I have a, a algor.com uh, through which I communicate to uh, a few million uh, people on a regular basis. Uh, I, have a, I have a television network call, called Current TV that's connected to current.com that is designed to connect the internet to the television medium. So I spend a lot of time uh, working on that as well. But you're not secretly blogging for a group of your friends or uploading pictures to Flickr of playing, yourself playing with your dog or so on? Uh, no. No. I, 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 have a re I, I have regular tweets, regular uh, postings on uh, algor.com and Facebook. Um, and lots and lots of emails. We'll have all of the campus areas friending you on Facebook by the end of the afternoon. Meanwhile, Tim. Well, yeah, I use the web. I mean, I use the web. Uh, when we started the web consortium, which is where I spent a lot of my time working, we started the rule that everything is on the web. So if you come to a meeting and you want to discuss something uh, and you come with some paper, you have to, you know, you have to scan it give it a URL. If you don't give it a URL, you can't discuss it. Because a lot of the people are elsewhere in the world, we use IRC chat, internet relay chat. Internet relay chat was around before the web. You know, so, uh, and so we have a chat room. We, when we have a teleconference, there's a chat room uh, associated with it so that you can sort out all the bit details of who's, uh, who's no, which, of chairing the meeting and who wants to speak next is all done on a chat so that we talk, we have the audio channel, and we have the chat channel. We have some bots which help us, robots on the chat channel, which help manage the, um, the audio things, and uh, manage, and they help with preparing the minutes for the meetings and things like that. Um, so we have this rule that if it doesn't, if it doesn't, uh, if it's not on the web, it doesn't exist. And I find it a shock when I come to an organization where it's not like that, when people talk about something and it doesn't have a URL. Uh, we n never m move things. We put them in with one URL, and we keep the yeah, and we same. change the way that the access that people have. We make it first private, then later public. But it always URL stays the same, so the links never break. So there are a few ways we've worked uh, like that. Yes, I do tweet actually generally through identity.ca. The identity car is one of the many uh, decentralized uh, tweeting th uh, uh, tweeting sites. It in fact feeds. I have a Twitter account, and it feeds into to my account, uh, Tim Berners-Lee on, on uh, Twitter.com as well. Um, so 
I use, uh, I don't use social networking sites a lot. So if you want to uh, contact me, you have to actually go to my web page and find out how to contact me. And it will involve using email, the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the real email, which is also a decentralized protocol. So um, yeah, I use the web all the time. I'm using it a huge amount. I use also the semantic web. Uh, we've got uh, you know data about what I, I what uh, about work is available in the semantic web using the semantic web where I do my taxes I do that I take all my bank statements I convert them into semantic web format I run inference engines on them to produce the taxes uh, and so on so I basically any accounting I have to do which I generally hate instead I use semantic web technology and spend my time programming uh, methods of doing it instead of do, which takes about the same amount of time as it would have taken to do the account but it's much more fun much more fun well today we've learned about taking to the streets and defending the web we've learned about reinventing the education system and using open government data to mitigate climate change we found that there is probably a secret Facebook account that Al Gore's not telling us about no no <laughs> I'd just like to thank Tim Berners-Lee, Al Gore, all of you. Have a good afternoon. Obrigado. FPE, a forte applauso. Lembren de retornar os... Oh, os aparelhos detrás do sound simultânea, cá do lado do, do palco principal. Não esqueçam. Obrigado. Realmente foi incrível. Parabéns para todos nós. Incrível.